This evening, we are going to be in the book of Haggai. Some people say Haggai. Some people just say the one with the H there. And they, Where is it, you ask? Okay, so if you get to the New Testament, Matthew, right? Flip to. All right, well, <laughs> I like this call and response, but you guys aren't quite doing it my way, okay? <laughs> so we're actually going to be in chapter 2 this evening. I am skipping over chapter 1, but I'll tell you what, I'll give you a little summary of chapter 1 because, and here's why. So I was reading through this book, Haggai, during my devotional time, and um, first chapter just oh, got me. I mean, like the Holy Spirit just blessed me by convicting me, blessed me by definitely edifying me. It was one of those. Here's the thing in, in uh, Haggai chapter 1, okay? So 70 years of captivity. The people were in Babylon, right? You remember Nebuchadnezzar? He was a bad guy. He came. He took all the people. He took all of God's people back to Babylon. It was 70 years long, their captivity, but finally, a remnant of them got to go back to Jerusalem where they would get to build the temple. Well, the people go, and they sort of get going. They sort of start, except they don't do a very good job once they sort of start. What happens is they kind of start to look inward. They start to look at themselves, even though God has given them a task. They look inwardly. Does that sound a little familiar to all of us? God gives us a task and we just kind of go, ooh, wait a minute now, what about me? They had a few issues here and there, but um, unfortunately, unfortunately, they really forgot why they were there. Why were they in Jerusalem? They were there because God put them there. Why were they there? They were there to build. They were there to rebuild the temple. You know what happened? Oh, they started rebuilding for themselves. They had nice homes. They were taking the cedar of Lebanon, this wood, and you know what? Instead of taking it to the temple, they were taking it home. And they were building some pretty nice houses for themselves while the temple there kind of laid desolate. And what does God do? He says, well, I'm not going to bless those people. I sent them there. I'm not going to bless them. And what happens then during that time frame? Drought. The harvests, oh man, anything but plentiful. Um, bad guys, just all sorts of difficulties for these people. And they're sitting there going, you know, oh, woe is me. Lord, I'm suffering. Lord, I don't know why I'm suffering. <laughs> you ever done that before? Lord, I don't know why I'm suffering. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit about, well, you know, when you suffer, it's okay to pray and ask God, is it because I'm not blessing you, Lord? It's okay to say that prayer, but there's a little more to it than that. Anyway, so they're suffering. They turn from what they were supposed to do. They were neglecting the priority of life. Christian, the priority of life, the reason you are here. And I'm not just talking literally here, praise God, you're here to grow in the Lord. But the reason you are here, meaning you exist, why you breathe, why you are who you are, where you are, it's because God has placed you there. And we forget so easily. And that's when we start turning to ourselves. That is when we forget that we're supposed to be building for God. We take the cedar wood and we take it home, so to speak, and we build for ourselves. It's a great study. You know what? Since we are doing chapter two, I want to encourage all of you guys to read one and two, okay? Put them together, and boy, the Lord did such a great ministry in my heart, and I know he will in yours. So chapter two, why, are, why is chapter, uh, uh, excuse me, why are we, why does this prophet Haggai come to the people? This is why. Because he says, Hey, people in Jerusalem, 
God's people. Do you see why things are so tough for you? Let me tell you why. And so he tells them why. And the good thing is, praise the Lord, they respond. They respond. They respond well. These um, leaders, uh, Joshua the prophet, they respond very well. Zerubbabel is the, is the leader at the time. They respond well. The people say, oh, you are right. The people take their axes. They climb up the mountains. They cut down these nice trees. They bring the wood back and they start building up the temple. They start bringing their provision to the temple because they want to build it up now. So everything is going well. That's chapter one. That's encouraging. God blessed their efforts. There was more to it, of course, than that, but God blessed it. So you guys, you can see right off what happens. God gives a purpose. The people go, okay, whoops. God doesn't bless them. They repent and turn back. God blesses them. That's, um, that's a praise the Lord -er for me. I'm glad God, I, I'm so appreciative that my God does that for me and I know he does that for you. So again, one more exhortation. Haggai chapters one and two, this week, study it. Let it be a part of your devotions, okay? Now in chapter two, we move on then in seeing the blessings that God is bringing upon the people. He is going to use the prophet to say, let me tell you what's to come. Uh, I'm recognizing what it is that you're doing now, so let me tell you what's to come. And uh, boy, it brings a smile to your face when you see what it is that he says at the end there. Man, sakes, that leader, he is a blessed leader, all right. Um, let's pray, and we're going to start right from verse 1 of chapter 2, okay? Uh, God, we praise you and thank you that you are that God. You are a God of grace. You are a God of mercy. We thank you so much that you forgive us. Lord, that you bless us. God, I think uh, even more than that, that you desire to use us. I mean, who are we? Uh, Father, we praise you for that. We thank you that we can be called the children of God. Jesus, thank you that you made that so. And this evening, we desire to be encouraged and exhorted by your word. The Holy Spirit, our hearts are just open for your ministry. And we pray, Lord, you'll speak to each one of us just the way we need it tonight, please. It's our desire to walk from here um, having grown in the Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 1. It says this, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Um, by the way, chapter two, here's the people there and the prophet is now giving them another sermon. In this book, uh, chapters one and two, he gives sort of what people will call sermonettes. I don't think they're sermonettes. I think they're full on sermons. He gives four of them. And the time period between the beginning and the end of this book, four months. That's the shortest work, four months, when he sees all of this great stuff come. So anyway, here he is in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. So right now is the Feast of Tabernacles. You heard that? That's kind of their Thanksgiving time over there in Israel. That's where they remember that God took them through the desert for 40 years and provided for their every need. He was a pillar of fire and a, and a pillar of cloud. Uh, this was a time of the harvest where they would do the ingathering of the harvest. It was, it was right here. And this particular day is October 17th, 520 BC. You know, we have the exact calculation, the dates. This is October 17th of 520 BC. And so it's the last day of this feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's on this day that God is going to explain to them, tell them about his blessings of them. So he says in verses 2 and 3, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you? Uh, excuse me, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? So in those 
amongst the people of God, there would have been some people who were uh, more advanced in age. <laughs> they were a little more advanced in age. They would have been a part of the original exile to Babylon. How long did that exile last? 70 years. So there would have been some older folks who had been a part of Jerusalem before Nebuchadnezzar comes along, and they would have seen this temple, Solomon's temple. Oh, man. If you've not ever seen pictures, uh, you should see it. You should see models of what that thing was like. It was incredible. Anyway, so these people had seen it. Nebuchadnezzar comes along and absolutely destroys it and takes the people captive. Um, that temple was white marble and stone. The interior was that cedar, you know, that Le uh, of Lebanon. Uh, it was lined with pure gold. The walls were studded with jewels. I have read these estimates that it would have been worth the equivalent of hundreds of billions of dollars today. By far the most valuable building in all of history of the earth, this particular temple. And then what made it, I think, priceless was just picture it now. You had gold lined walls with the jewels in them and you had the Shekinah glory. You had the glory of God in there. You had God in there. You had him, he, he lit up the place. And so his light is, you know, bouncing off of this gold and these jewels. And you can't even look at it. It's so bright and so stunning and so beautiful. Could you imagine being a part of that? That's what he's saying here. He goes, who is left among you who saw it the way it once was? Oh. If you look in the book of Ezra, don't go there now. It says that there were people who wept. There were people who wept because they knew what the previous temple was like. You know what was here in front of them? Weeds. It was here in front of them, broken down uh, uh, mud and, and dried cracked dirt and all of that stuff. I, could only, I can only imagine having seen what was compared to what is. And God says, I know. I remember. Do you? Uh, here's, here's what gets really sweet. Look at, look at verse 4. This is an encouragement by God. He goes, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work. For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Let me tell you what I have underlined there twice. Two words, be strong. Be strong. Do you and I underestimate that exhortation? Do we underestimate what it means to be told by God simply this, be strong? I think I do. Sometimes it does happen. I forget the depth of be strong. Um, in the last days of Moses' life, so he's taken all these people. What is it, a two-million-man church? Uh, women and children, too? A couple million people or so? So he takes them all the way through after 40 years, and God says, uh, Moses, you're not going any further. I need some final words with you. And he goes, oh, um, go get my, uh, my next, the next leader, uh, Joshua. Bring him here because I need to talk to him too. <laughs> you understand I'm paraphrasing God there, okay? You won't find those exact words there. But this is in Deuteronomy. And he says to Moses, he says, Moses, I've led you, my servant, 40 years. Uh, the people have been rebellious. The people have been blessed. They will go on to receive my promised land. They will become big and strong. However, they will also rebel. So he's given them everything right there. Joshua, he's, remember, Joshua was 100 years old at this time. So, so this, is, this is what's so amazing. He finds out that over the next seven years of his life, he's going to be taking the people. Well, here's the thing. He's only going to live to be 107 years old. So what he's told is, in these final years of your life, you're going to take my two million people or so who are a bunch of crybabies, 
They're rebellious. They don't do good all the time. And um, <clears throat> let's see, you're going to take them here and there, and problems are going to happen. You're going to, one day, you're going to yell, you know, as for me and my house, you know, we shall serve the Lord, uh, and then you're going to die. Like, oh, okay. You know what? You know what one exhortation God gives to that man? Two words. Be strong. I've never caught that before. He says, be strong and courageous. It starts with the punch. Be strong. And that's what is supposed to guide him and, and um, build him up and motivate him and draw him to do what he is. This, be strong. This is what God tells a guy who's going to lead his people and then die. Be strong. That's amazing. He doesn't say, Joshua, let me explain the whole deal to you. I'm going to give you scouts. I'm going to give you real great wisdom. I'm going to give you this and that. He doesn't. Deuteronomy 31, 7 and 8, okay? Be strong and courageous. there first everywhere you look to the side to the right or to the left I will be at your right I will be at your left and that's why a guy like Joshua and that's why people like you and me Christian we can just be okay by being told be strong you know what I do too much I ask God for the whole plan I ask the Lord to convince me why I should be okay going forward I don't just take sometimes, he goes, Raj, listen, listen, son, I've got a job for you. Here's your job, be strong. It's more like, um, Lord, could we go through step A and then step B and then step C? And I might need some sub steps in there as well. You ever do stuff like that? I, um, like I said, this book was such a great ministry to me as I was studying it. Be strong, you guys, don't estimate two words that God used to exhort the leader of his, of his people in Israel. Um, be humble enough to ask for forgiveness of somebody, even though you might think, well, there's some fault on their side as well. Hold on here. We serve a God of grace. We serve a God of mercy. We serve a Lord who says, be like me. Those are the sorts of things. You know, the only exhortation we need, be strong. We don't need steps A, B, and C and any sub-steps. Just those. I got to tell you, praying over what's going on in our country, thinking about how some churches are sort of showing weakness and then there are churches, I think, like ours, where we just stand on the truth of the Bible and we're going for it no matter what's in our way. You know what? This is the kind of thing, you guys, that's going to, um, like, revive his people. It's simply remembering, okay, we got the word. Look, we're studying the word. We're feeding on the word. We're getting strong in the word. But in living life, God's exhortation in these last days is be strong. And you'll do exactly what I need you to do. This is, to me, be strong, or the two words towards revival. Be strong. Be strong. Can you imagine? What did, what, did, what did Zerubbabel think? What did Joshua think? What did the people think? Obviously, they responded. Anyway, so it says in verse 5, let's go on, verse 5. Be strong, for I am with you, right? Then in verse 5, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. What is it again he's promising? I'm with you. I've promised ever since way back when that I would be with you. I'm with you. 
I promise you that you would be entering this land. I promise you that there would be this, the, the temple to come. I promised you, I promised you. Because I'm with you. I am your power. So be strong and be courageous. That's a refreshing thought, dearly beloved of God in this day and age. It's a promise. We won't just say, because we know God is with us, that we'll be strong. We'll say, the God who never breaks promises promises us that he will be with us. Then I can be strong. God loves his people so much. God loves them. God loves to speak to them. You know what? God loves to exhort his people. God has high expectations of his people. He is not blessed, you guys, when we sit around. It does not bless a God of ultimate, infinite power and strength to give us, to bless us with such power to just be sitting around, to go back to our homes and look at our cedar wood. What he wants to see us do is rebel in his power and use his power and accomplish his promises. That's what's going to happen here. God's going to use the people to accomplish his promise. So the temple, it's going to get built. This temple, whoa, one more observation. Check this out. Did God say to them at all, let me tell you how much the old church was worth versus how much the new church is going to be worth? You know what I mean, temple. Um, I want you to consider all of the dimensions of the old temple because I want this to be exactly the same. I want these million, thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of pure gold and silver to line every wall. He doesn't say that. What he says is, I've given you power. I've given you a promise. And I've given you a direction. This is what I want to have happen. Um, you know, how that encourages us. God doesn't compare temples. You know, oh, by the way, Christian, you know you're a temple of God, right? Yes, you are. You are. You and I, we are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. So temple, one doesn't compare ourselves to the other. One doesn't have to say, look how lavish, look how lovely, look how wonderful, look how blessed, look how talented, look how gifted. Not a one. It doesn't matter what your background is. God wants to abide in his temple. That's you. And that's what makes you infinitely, infinitely worth it. Nothing else. Forget the gold and the blah, blah, blah stuff. So, so you got to picture this now. The people are hearing something that they've been waiting for. They're getting all of this stuff through this prophet Haggai, and they're responding to it. And so Haggai just keeps on going. He goes, you know what? God, God's, God's got you there. He's going to take you there. Make sure you move on it. This is um, uh, an encouragement. I know there's some of you who need to hear this particular encouragement about you being the temple, about you having the power of God, you having the power. But you've got to have the faith and the courage to step forward. I don't know. I think there's a few of you here who are in that boat. This is, this is definitely for you. Like I said, it was for me too. Anyway, so going on, verses 6 and 7, look. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> the people are hearing what's, a, what's going to happen. You understand? This is prophecy future here. Stuff that even to our day today, you guys, 2015, has yet to happen. If you want a scripture reference, Hebrews 12, verses 6 and 7. When God spoke from Mount...
man, you think I'm powerful. You've seen everything that I've done. You've seen how my promises have come to pass. You ain't seen nothing yet. One day, something amazing is going to happen for sure. Uh, God saying to his people, since you know, how are you going to act? If you know that what's best is yet to come, children of God, how are we going to react? What, what, what God says is, I want you to react by acting. I want you to react by acting in the here and now. I've got a plan. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. And it turns out that what I'm having you do right now is intimately, intricately connected to what's to come. And I think that's probably one of the beautiful revelations that God gave me as well was this. If we ain't seen nothing yet, turns out that he wants us to be a part of getting there. Who are you in God's army? Remember, we just talked about being in God's army. Who are you in um, serving the Lord? Who are you in faithfully persevering in your call? Who are you, dearly beloved? I'll tell you who you are. You are an important, imperative part of what's to come. God values you and me so much that he says, I'm going to deliver a promise, but I want you to be a part of it. Can you imagine these people hearing God saying that to them? I want you to be a promise of what's to come. That's why I need you to do what I've called you to do. I mean, when you have an opportunity to be a part of God's plan of what is to come in the future, how can we not but become cheerleaders for God? How can we not but take up the arms, you know, and be soldiers for the living God? He says things which, things which eye has not seen or ear has not heard and which not have entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared before him. For to us, God revealed them, not through a prophet. It says, for God revealed them through the Spirit. Hey, we got it. None of us gets to say, I was ignorant. None of us get to say, you never told me, God. No, he said the exact same thing to me and to you. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet, and you're going to be a part of it. You guys, everything you're called to do, please think about it. Firstly, eternally. Remember that? A worldly perspective is a weak perspective. You need to have an eternal perspective. I've used the whole metaphor of the glasses, seeing everything through Jesus' glasses. Making sure that when you talk to people and interact with them, you are doing it with an eternal perspective. You're doing it like this. What would Jesus say? What would Jesus do? Because it's all connected to the eternal. It's not. It's not based on anything in the world. Sometimes the stuff we pursue is kind of nonsense, isn't it? Sometimes I'm embarrassed. I tried so hard to, you know, scrape up my last $10 to see that movie because it was so, oh, everybody wanted to see it. Oh, I worked so hard. I worked 18 hours of overtime this week because I think we're going to be able to save enough money for our summer vacation. Yeah, I missed the kids' recital, and I didn't get to go to church, and I didn't serve when I was supposed to. But I still got 18 hours of overtime. This is where Christians have to set themselves apart. You guys, we don't get to say stuff like that. We don't get to say, I'm working all that overtime because it's important for my family to have a vacation. That's not, that's not, there's no, there's no eternal wisdom in such planning or such state statements like that. We, we're supposed to say everything according to what God would want. And if God says, you know, for example, I'm supposed to train up my children. I'm supposed to be there with my wife and present her as a weaker vessel. And I'm supposed to teach my family about the things of God and whatnot. If I'm neglecting those, then what? Does that justify me saying, yeah, but in five months I get to get away with them? It doesn't. This is where, like I said again, you guys, Christians, be ever so careful to use what logic works in the world to justify what is supposed to justify eternal decisions. They don't connect. 
um, Paul, he goes, I press on, huh? didn't he? He said, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what's God saying to us so far? He's with us. Be strong. We can't let stuff, worldly stuff, backward stuff get in the way. We're always supposed to look forward with an eternal perspective because we get to be a part of his major plan. This is what he's telling these people that are going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Oh, one day we'll get to see those people. One day, as you're looking forward, looking to God's plan, always pressing on, what you can make sure that you revel in is that, you know, your friends that you lost, sons and daughters, some people have lost sons and daughters, husbands and wives, moms and dads, those who knew Christ. You know, together, we're going to be a part of that amazing shaking to come with them. We're going to be standing right next to them, worshiping our God seeing how somehow we were actually a part of this. That's definitely a humbling thought. Let's go on, you guys. Let's go to verses 8 and 9. So God has told them there's a promise to come. You guys are going to be a part of a promise. Now look, verses 8 and 9. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. <laughs> God just says, hey, remember it's all mine, please. It's all mine. It always has been. You don't have to worry about the Solomon Temple, gold, all those tons and tons. It was all mine anyway. Everything that is, everything that was, it's all mine. You know what that's meant to do, you guys, is put our minds at ease. I'm going to put, his, put our minds at ease. I think sometimes Christians are a little too stressed out over God in their lives. Why are we so stressed by our Father in heaven? You know, if I'm going to stress my boys out, well, it's probably because they like needed a little discipline or something. But my, my boys aren't stressed out when Dad walks into the room. They're jumping up and down. They want to give me hugs. They want to give me high fives. This is the way our Dad in heaven is. He says to us, stop worrying. Just know that I'm taking care of you. I've got expectations of you, which he just told them about, but I'm taking care of you. Sometimes people say, I'm just not sure. Is God blessing? Is, am I doing something wrong? I just don't quite understand if, and they, they verbalize um, this stress in different forms. Doubt, um, fear, um, well, a lot of others. But the question becomes, when you read the promise that God gave his people here, could we ever justify that that sort of stress God is the source of? Um, we definitely are convicted by God. But conviction is centered around correction, not punishment. Conviction is to reveal that you are unrighteous in one way or another and to say, if you will humble yourself and repent to me, saith the Lord, I will empower you to go the direction you need to go. That's why conviction is such a wonderful thing. Because when we say to the Lord, God, I know I sin, please convict me. God says, you got it. Now go this way. And what we do is we live in a way that blesses him further that has him do things like what? Use you more. Empower you with <clears throat> spiritual gifting like perhaps never before. Whatever it is. We mustn't, we mustn't misconstrue conviction for stress. Now, a little qualification. A person who doesn't respond to conviction this is where it's what I call self-imposed. Yes, God may be punishing you for being 
rebellious because that's what somebody is when they deny the, convic the conviction of the Lord. You are known as a rebel. And God doesn't like rebellion, does he? In fact, I think he has a place called hell for a whole bunch of rebels coming up in the future. He doesn't like re rebels. And so certainly those who rebel, and yet they want to remain sort of, you know, tender and, and sweetly connected to God, that's definitely not going to happen. God will not honor that. That defies his own character when he honors such a thing. That's why people who tell me they really try and try, oh, but I'm still hitting the bottle because I can't stop. I can't tell them, oh, well, that's okay, man. You know, you just try, but God's going to bless you everywhere else. You can't say something like that because the Bible doesn't teach anything like that. Anyway, so this all came from this, the stress, the pressure. How was God in it? I think rebellion is the primary way that people will say, God is stressing me out. We'll go on because I want to talk just a little bit more about that in a second. Okay? Go to um, verses 10 through 19. Okay, This is going to be, 10 through 19 is his third sermon. Remember I told you he did four? 10 through 19 would be called his third sermon. It says on the 24th day of the ninth month. If you want to know the date there, that's December 18th. Happens to be December 18th. It says, In the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? <laughs> God was asking him a riddle. The priests, they would make their sacrifices, you guys. You know, that's what they do. They make their sacrifices for the people. And, and these sacrifices were considered holy. And the Bible said God instructed them that the priests were allowed to keep a portion. So they would oftentimes keep them in the folds of their robes. That's where they would carry them. And so, and so God's like, well, tell me, if, if that touches something that's unholy, does this holiness sort of, mystically transfer into this unholy thing and you can see hey they they answered the riddle correctly they said no <laughs> you can't become holy through some secondary source obviously you guys you use this as you share the gospel for old testament references for sure we don't go through a secondary source to, for holiness before god do we we go through go to the source and that's Jesus you can't go through some organization you can't go through some priest you can't go through some ritual you can only go to the source himself touch him so to speak and there's holiness anyway so so they got that one uh, the next question then Haggai said if Someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these. Does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, it does become unclean. So the question, is unholiness transferable? Hmm. The law said that, let's just say you touched a dead body. And um, you touch the dead body, and then you touch this stool right here. And then I come along, and I touch the stool. You've taken my holiness away. Is that even possible to take my holiness away? But you've taken my holiness away because you were unholy. You touched that dead body. You touched this stool, which made the stool unholy. And yes, indeed, I sat down on it, and I become holy. That's what the law said. Um. It's like passing on sickness. Right? My youngest son, the reason my wife's not here is because my youngest boy, Benji, has pink eye. And that, if you know anything about it, is extremely contagious. So um, we ain't bringing him. But let's just say we did. I would have mothers rush the stage right now. Um, 
you know, Benji couldn't go upstairs to your kid and, and say, could you touch my eye, please? And suddenly their healthy eye would like transfer health into his. It would pretty much go the other way, right? That's what happens. And um, as far as spiritual things go, you guys, I think what God is trying to say is it is so easy. It is so easy for unholiness to be transferred. It's so contagious. What did Jesus say if your right hand caused you to sin? What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to cut it off. What about your right eye? What happens then? You're supposed to pluck it out. Sin, unholiness is so contagious that God would rather have you amputate yourself than to take any other chance. And what, what, what um, the prophet is saying to these people here is in essence, um, all this time, God's people thought they were doing holy work. Because remember now, they did come, they did start the temple, and they did build their homes, and they were still trying to be, quote, godly. So what are they thinking of? They're only thinking about the holy parts of their lives, right? God says, you're thinking about it in the wrong direction. You're thinking because sometimes you would do a sacrifice to me or you would pray to me, suddenly your entire lives would become characterized by holiness. And he actually, through the prophet, he says, no, 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 no. Just think, anything that corrupts has caused corruption. And you must not underestimate it. This is all about don't underestimate the power of sin. Don't misunderstand how dangerous it is. Don't underestimate. Um, give sin credit. As a pastor, I counsel many people. And eventually when we get sort of the bottom of things, because when I counsel people, I got to tell them this. We're using scripture. That's our foundation. That's it. I'm not a psychologist. I counsel with the word. And people will tell me about their issues. They will tell me about their problems. And we'll be able to get to the verses or to the sections where it turns out that they're not in line with God. And oftentimes, instead of the person simply saying, Thank you, Lord, that you've used our discussion to show me where my sin has caused me to fall. Conversation goes something like this. Yeah, but what about in Luke where it says, I know, I know that's true, but you should have heard the way she was. And I get all of this justification. You know, I say my devotions and I pray for my husband, but no, we don't talk. These sorts of things, basically that person needs to stand here before the prophet. And they need to take a riddle. They need to answer a riddle. You guys, let us never underestimate the power of our sin in our lives, okay? Don't underestimate it. God is blessed when you humble yourself in his sight and seek his forgiveness. You know that? You know you bless God when you do that? And of course, what does God do to you? Bless you. Then Haggai answered and said, so, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. There it is. That was an explanation basically of don't underestimate the unholiness, boy, it corrupted everything. Verses 15 through 19. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. Okay, here's where my, my underline comes. But from this day on, I will bless 
That's such a cool promise. I really do hope it becomes part of your devotions. He's saying, yeah, you see all the junk in the past? You see that sin caused all of this? Do you see how I noticed sin caused it, therefore I didn't bless you? Did you notice how the farmers walked up and they thought, boy, this week, I mean, this year we're going to get a harvest. And they ended up harvesting like half of what they thought they were going to get. Did you see that? He goes, but now you people are responding to me, so listen up. What I'm going to do is bless you. So here's where the question has come to me. Let me now answer a question. So Raj, when bad things happen to me, is God telling me I'm in sin? Well, I, I, I've looked for jobs. I probably looked for 18 jobs now. I got no money. Um, my relationships, they're seeming to crumble. I just, I, I'm not making it, man. Is God telling me something? Well, what can I say? What does the Bible say? There's really two ways to look at it. He just answered number one. Number one is God does notice our sin. God does punish us. Or another way of putting it often is he doesn't, quote, bless us. Okay, that's one way. But there is also the other way. And the New Testament very often teaches us this. In fact, Jesus was a model of this. He lived a perfect life. He loved people. He demonstrated grace. He loved the unlovable. He did things that people wouldn't do. He had wisdom unlike any other. He always drew people to God. But what happened to him? He got slashed and beaten to the point of not being recognizable. And he got hung up on a cross naked. And he died. So how do you balance the two? What do you do? And this is where my, my counsel to the person goes like this. Definitely one is it takes your... It takes passionate, consistent prayer because it needs to be you and God hooked up. You need to be connected. It needs to be you understanding what God's expectations for your life are. So what does that mean? You need to be reading your Bible. And then number three, you need to um, be strong. So what does that mean? Act on what you know. If you've got those things like so, you know, as God would want, then what's happening to you, my answer to you would be, is what's supposed to be. It is God's will for your life in a way that is blessing him. It is according to his perfect will. So, man, be strong still. Keep, you know, filling out those applications. Keep smiling at people and trying to hug them and love them and tell them Jesus loves them. Keep doing the righteous things. But inevitably, you guys, here's what happens when somebody takes up that challenge. They get to those points where they go, yeah, you're right. I'm not hitting it right here. Um, I'm, I'm compromising here. I'm not really treating her as Christ would treat the church. These kinds of things often come back to me. So I hope that answer was good because that's what the Bible teaches Okay? You're connected with the Lord. You know what God wants of you. That's the word. And number three, by faith, you walk in it. I, I, I think I've said that. I haven't said it in a long time, but then you let the chips fall where they may. It's kind of that answer. Okay? Um, one pastor I was talking to, here's what he told me. He said, you know what, dude, when you get to that, you're going to find two different kinds of people. Those who overanalyze and those who underanalyze. He said, be right in the middle. I'm like, thanks. Yeah, that really helped me. Okay, I'll, I'll be right in the middle. But I got it. God did teach me the essence of what he said. Okay, so now we at least we understand uh, how God responds to his people. God loves to bless his people. But God expects of his people. Closing, closing verses. In fact, you know what? I'm not even reading the closing verses. You know all I want to do here? I just want to give you a little, a little summary here. You know where it says there um, that the prophecy is it? I don't know if any of you have studied this prophecy, but it, it almost got me side, 
sidetracked. It was so interesting. But where it says here um, the 24th day, it keeps on saying this day, the 24th day, December 18th, 520 B.C. that I told you about. It's so interesting because this is the day that ends what's called the desolation of Jerusalem, right? If you go back to Ezekiel 24, uh, 2 Kings 24, Jeremiah 52, you see how it all started the 10th of Teboth, which is five in 590 B.C., okay? That's a date in 590 B.C. Um, that's when desolation of Jerusalem began. When you go exactly 25,200 days forward from that date back in 590 B.C., you land on this day exactly. Oh, okay, big deal. Well, it just so happens that they use 360-day calendars, and that's exactly 70 years to the day when the desolation started, to the day that the desolation stopped. You see that word used, December 18th? I'm sorry, the 24th day? That was the 70th year ending. It's, it's a really cool prophecy. Like I said, you can get into it and you can start studying it forever. But I thought I would just bring it up. Here's where it ends. Talk about a blessing of God. What did we say? Oh, yeah, God's got future plans and we get to be a part of it. How cool is this? Oh, it just so happens that I prophesied this long, 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 long time ago, and today's the day it's starting, and you get to be a part of it, folks. I would say they were smiling, too. Uh, Haggai goes on to tell Zerubbabel that he's a good guy. <laughs> That's my summary of those final verses. <laughs> You're a good guy. I wish pastors could, I wish that could be my Bible study. You guys, uh, Matthew chapter 8, um, Jesus is a good guy. God bless you. Have a great day. That'd be wonderful. He says, he says basically this, Zerubbabel, um, you have a heart. Okay, this is me throwing some words in there. You have a heart like David, King David. In other words, you want to do what God wants you to do, and you'll step up and do it. What are the two words? Be strong. You will be strong, man, and I recognize it. And then he goes on a little bit more, and he points out that through Zerubbabel, well, the Messiah would come. Turns out that this guy happens to be in both lines, Joseph and Mary. If you, if you, watch, if you go down one of those lines, you know, the lineages, you see this dude on both. It's, it's very cool. Once again, what is God saying? Be strong now. I got a plan ahead, and you get to be a part of it. This guy is like, he's in it. Yeah, he's in it to win it. A couple of verses then I'm going to close with, okay? I want to close with two that the Lord gave me tonight. Um, and this is for you and me, Christian, listening. Um, John 15, Jesus says to the people, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Remember what I said when we do God's will, we bless him. God loves to be loved. He says, if you do my commandments, you will remain in my love, and God loves. Um, uh, John 15, verse 15. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. You are my friends if you do what I command. I hope um, that ministered to you as much as it ministered to me, that my God in heaven calls me his friend is beyond what I can even describe to you. And he says this though, Raj, listen, our friendship, man, it's tight, but you gotta do what I tell you to do. What else could I do but fall down and pray before the Lord? <laughs> That's what I did. Okay, you guys, Haggai, read that book on your own. Study it and let the Lord minister to you, okay? Let the Holy Spirit correct you if you need correction. Let the Holy Spirit convict you if you need conviction. And, of course, let him encourage you, empower you to be strong. Let's pray.